Episode 171 of Australia's number one marketing show. Like the idea of becoming more visible, more valuable, and more connected in your industry? Excellent. Then listen up. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day and welcome back to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. I am your host and feeling very, very pumped too, by the way. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some unbelievably good marketing and build that beautiful, beautiful empire that you deserved and you deserved, you deserve. You might have deserved it in the past, you deserve it now. And we are brought to you by the very, very good folk at Net Registry who get your online marketing sorted. That's what they do. They do it in their sleep. They're that good at it. So if you just want to focus on creating a wonderful business, then get the folk at Net Registry to do your search engine optimization, to do your Google AdWords, to design your website, to develop your website, to host it, to do all that stuff, to register domain names, all that stuff that you just don't want to do, that you want to get on with the business of working on the business strategically, you know, make things hum. Get a virtual marketing team around you that is going to do the dirty work and make things work in your favor. And that's what Net Registry do. And uh, you can visit them at netregistry.com.au or you can head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the Net Registry banner, and will be revealed three exclusive listener packages that Net Registry have put together with very, very crunchy prices. Hello to everyone also from the Flying Solo community. We love yous. All right. <laughs> Overseas people must, must be going, my God, are all Australians like that? Do they really say we love yous? No, we don't. It's just me. Do not fear. I'm not here to represent all Australians, although I'm very proud to be one. Now, uh, we've got a listener question today about podcasting, which I adore. Uh, didn't know that, did you? Uh, we have got some news about a meetup that I've got coming up in Melbourne town and some travel news. I'm heading off around uh, to various parts of Australia and the world in the coming months and uh if you're interested in meeting up, if you're interested in maybe uh, helping put together a mastermind with some like-minded, motivated small business owners, then uh, hit me up. I'll tell you how you can do that shortly. Um, I have got a very, very valuable forum development to share with you. And then today's guest, today's guest is Tracy Angwin, who has used a very, very clever five-step process to help turn her business into something quite special and to make her industry, which is payroll, I know, can you believe it? Payroll, interesting and an asset, not an expense, as Tracy says. So really excited to reveal what that five-step process is and take you through how Tracy has applied it in her business. We've got a lot to cover. I suggest we jump right in. Okay, well, I am going to get stuck straight in. Normally, around this time, I would answer a listener question, but today, I'm going to shake things up a bit. I'm going to get stuck straight in to today's guest, who is Tracy Angwin. She is the founder and managing director of the Australian Payroll Association, but don't turn off. Don't go to sleep. Just because I said Australian Payroll Association, you're thinking, really? Great marketing? Not possible. I'll go and listen to another podcast. No, don't, because Tracy has managed to make payroll really interesting, and she is doing okay as a result of some wonderful marketing and a five-step process that Tracy has been through, and in fact, I've been through as well. It's called the KPI process. It's a 40-week It's a 40-week program, a 40-week incubator. It's not for the faint-hearted, but it is a wonderful five-step process that's broken up into, uh, this will test me, pitching, publishing, profiling, packaging, and partnershipping. <laughs> partnershipping. And um, it's, it's a tried and tested process. Uh, it's fantastic. I'm now a speaker on the KPI program, and uh, I speak obviously about marketing. Funny that. But Tracy has successfully gone through the program, and in this fireside chat I have with her, she explains exactly how she activated 
each of the five Ps, fascinating. You know, it's absolutely fascinating. As I say, everything is marketing and marketing is everything. And, you know, whether we're talking about profiling here or publishing a book or developing partnerships, I mean, every aspect of it, every aspect of that is about marketing your business. So tune into that and have look at this, listen to this interview through that lens of marketing as you would normally do. Uh, and Tracy has managed, as I said, to turn payroll into something special. So without further ado, I will hand over to Tracy Angwin, Managing Director of, I know, I know, Australian Payroll Association. Tracy Angwin, Australian Payroll Association Founder, Managing Director. Welcome to Small Business Big Marketing. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm looking forward to this discussion, Trace. Good. Very much. We have got some marketing ground to cover. Excellent. Massive pause there, Trace. You're scaring me. <laughs> it was like you were questioning. It was like, have we really? Yeah, I'm wondering what marketing ground we've got to cover, but I'm, I'm <laughs> going to leave it with you. I love that. And so I, I, I speak to a lot of successful small business owners, and not all of them, but like you just did then, some of them think they're not great marketers, but my view is marketing is everything and everything is marketing, and every duck that you've lined up to get Australian Payroll Association to where it is has has had um, some influence on the marketing of your business. So I'll, I'll, I'll rip that out of you if it's the last well, thing I ever do. Please do. Righto. <laughs> now, I want to start firstly, however, as a fellow corporate escapee, Trace, and do you mind if I call you Trace or oh, is it really? Yeah. You're very welcome. It's much nicer than a lot of things I'm called. <laughs> Good idea. Well, as a fellow corporate SKP, Trace, when did you escape and from what? Well, I escaped um, about, it was about 2008 um, and I had spent about 16 years in basically selling and managing sales teams for payroll organisations. So organisations that... Um, develop and support the payroll function, um, technology companies, a um, l- little bit of outsourcing. Mm. But we'd a- I'd actually spend a lot of time in sales and also a little bit in product development. So spending 16 or 17 years talking to people who uh, have a responsibility for payroll and just understanding what their problems are. Were, so, were you going nuts working for the man or the woman uh, or did you just see a massive opportunity that wasn't being filled out in the marketplace? Well, I think I think there are two things. One is that it was uh, – um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that no one that I worked for is going to listen to this because it was, to be honest, I got to the point where I was working really hard, but it was just a bit soul destroying. I really wasn't getting anywhere. I was spending my whole time doing board reports and sending them to London head offices and things, wondering mm. if anyone ever read this stuff. Yeah. Um, and really didn't feel like I was really making it any, any difference to, you know, it, it, it in, in my role. So, um, yeah, right. But on the, on the flip side of that, I did recognize that. You know, there was an organisation that does something similar to what we do now, but they've been and they've been doing some great work over sort of fifteen or twenty years, and they had actually filled a gap in the market. But I just felt that like they were doing the same things that they were twenty years before, and there was a real need in the in the market, in a certain segment of the market at least, for some choice and for some sort of more, more modern ways of doing things and and taking it to really that next level. Yeah, okay. So you, you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually get you to dig a, dig a bit deeper on that based on an email that you sent me if you choose to. But <laughs> sure. um, So you, you've got itchy feet. You're in, you're in corporate life, unsatisfied, um, saw an opportunity out in the marketplace, an organisation doing what you wanted to do. But in a way, I love the description. Can I read it or do you want to repeat what, the way you described this organisation? You can read it. <laughs> they were uh, still, in fact, old-fashioned and pretty vanilla. Frankly, from a sales and product offering point of view, they are flabby and do things no differently than they did 20 years ago. Now, hello to that organisation yes. if you are listening. <laughs> right. But 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 good on you, you know, like challenging that category. You know, that, that takes guts. Well, you know, it, it was one of those things that um – it just I, I would I, I just would have didn't want to die wondering. So I thought, well, I'd I'd give it a crack and see what happened and put my money where my mouth was and um and, and luckily luckily I got enough people to to agree with me and but the the thing the thing with that business is it's, it's like I say provided some great some great support for a, a number of years. 
But what they were very focused on is just the compliance aspect of payroll. And frankly, I find that the boring bit. Yes, it's important. We've got to have compliant payrolls. The ATO don't look kindly if you don't. Um, but there was more to it than that. So I, I really wanted to take that sort of business cost of payroll, which is just looked at as a transactional-based office function, really to be an operational asset because I'd worked with organisations in the past from a technology point of view and a process re-engineering point of view where I, I knew that I could actually change what they did to actually add, add real value to their business. So, And that was what was really missing. And the other thing that was really missing, Tim, which is is what I really uh, have spent the last couple of years really focusing on is really professionalizing the payroll function. And, and I don't I don't mean just, uh, you know, making them dress better or anything like that or, ha- or be able to have presentation skills, but it's really taking uh, something that was, like I say, a transactional-based function and, and getting it recognized in, in the world as a profession because payroll is very underestimated by anyone who's, who's not in payroll. Mm-hmm. Apparently, there's this big red payroll button that people sort of push every week or fortnight or month, and it just happens. It's yeah. not the case at all. What do you mean? Well, there's there's a whole <laughs> yeah, well exactly. Let me let me inf- no let me no educate don't you. don't explain <laughs> payroll, please please. But but I yeah. want I want you to explain how you've um you've put the sassy into payroll, the sex into payroll. Dare I say? Because um another quote which I love of yours, and and I love the way you you even wrote the email to me, Trace, giving some background on where you're at. But you say, quote, payroll is stereotypically run by 50-something grey-haired ladies from the suburbs in sensible flat shoes and polyester slacks, unquote. And hello to all you 50-year-old ladies out in the suburbs who listen to the show. But love that. So, again, I mean, you're tackling, you're tackling it head on. Well, the thing is, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I don't lose friends for this. But you're right. It's... Um that's the stereotype of your of your payroll uh, mistress, or mm-hmm. and, and you know behind mistress. the Jeez. behind the 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 you know the um the glass sort of curtain handing out you know or, orange little slips of paper <laughs> with, with cash. I mean, that's just not how it works anymore. And what what I think the biggest the biggest gap in terms of payroll was the fact that unlike any other profession, it didn't have. Um, anywhere that you could actually get qualified because if you were a, a lawyer or an, a, a, an eye, um, you know, an opt, opt, you know, optical person or optometrist. You know, optometrist, thank you, or a dentist or whatever you are, you've got some, some regulatory body that mm-hmm. says, yes, you have the skills and competencies to do this, whereas payroll's got a heap of complexity and there's huge risk in getting it wrong, but there was no way that could, could actually put a, uh, a line in the sand and say, these are the competencies for payroll um, professionals. And yet you could do lots of – there's many, many places you can do payroll training. So I spent about 18 months fighting with um, the Australian government and the, the Skills and Qualifications Authority to convince them that payroll was a specialist profession and needed that um, those qualifications in the Australian Qualifications Framework. And once we've been able to do that, then we can actually take that to employers and now we've had our first graduates and we're delivering this through through TAFE. So we've got real teachers teaching this, not just, you know, Tracy's, um, you know, payroll course kind of thing. I, I, I want to explore that because that's that's like that's marketing right there. I, I want to explore just stepping back before we do kind of approach how you've gone about putting the Australian Payroll Association together and there's a sort of a five-step process that both you and I have followed to varying degrees in our own businesses, um, which we're going to tackle in a minute. But I am really interested, Trace, about this idea of taking on an industry and saying the industry can do it better. Someone sees a business, they think it's undermarketed or whatever, and they buy it and they turn it around. But you've looked at an industry, and um, I find that really interesting because you you are about building, making that interesting industry accessible, interesting, uh, and attracting a higher quality of person, haven't you? Well, that, well, that's the thing, and the. What I found was there was a section of the of the payroll industry, a, a large section of the payroll uh, payroll professionals, that really wanted to do things differently, but just didn't know how, and perhaps needed some direction and some um, and and just some sort of Dutch courage, really, just that they could go to their organ their organisations and say, "Look, I can do this." They're heavy drinkers, aren't they? <laughs> Maybe that helps. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
but you know, it, because it's payroll's always been around, you know, a, a financial number and compliance risk, which is, like I say, is really important. But if you start looking at processes and efficiency and governance, and more importantly than that, even getting all that right allows you to have a have a low cost efficient payroll function that provides really critical information to the business, so they can make informed decisions based on their payroll data. A, an example of that is. Um, a client that I worked with a couple of uh, a couple of years ago is uh, an organisation that provides hearing tests. They're semi they're government funded, and they provide hearing tests and hearing aids to um, people around around the country. They've got about fifteen hundred staff in about one hundred and fifty odd um, different locations, and and they were. They employ audiologists. Audiologists are not on every street corner. They're hard to find. So what they would do is they would sh- they would fill shifts and they would literally have to fly people from Geelong to the Gold Coast to, to fill a shift or and then they'd have all this overtime components that be- mm. just because that they had these not, not a lot of audiologists to find. So by by looking at their, their payroll processes, by um, analysing their data and looking at how they did, we could actually we, – we reduced the cost of them – um, delivering their payroll function by fifty five percent. They've got a really efficient payroll process now. They've got they haven't actually cut heads, but what they're using is the heads that they've got that now don't do payroll traditional payroll processing. Are actually doing analytics and offering information to the business, and they don't do all that flying around anymore. Um, and and they know exactly what they're getting, so they can change their rostering processes, for example, because of the information that they get out of their payroll. So that's the sort of thing that you know. I could see that businesses sort of knew that that might be the case, but needed needed an organisation to help them get there. Trace, you have um, approached the creation of your business in a in a very clever way using this five step process that I want to kind of dig deep on now. Um, first of all, before we get stuck into that, Australian Payroll Association is an interesting name in itself because mm-hmm. it kind of says. We're not just a uh, business operating in the payroll industry. We are the go-to place. Is that intentional? Well, you know, what? I, I'd prefer it if that wasn't the name. Um, mm. the the issue The issue I had is that, um, and and a lot of organisations that do have association the name are um, PTY limited companies. I've since found out, but the issue was is the organisation that. Um, that we had the uh, with the vanilla flavor, you know, <laughs> twenty year uh, yeah. issues. They 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 have association in their name, and and more so than that, they had recently when when I decided when I really decided to um uh, to to provide an alternative in the industry was when they were sold by their founder. It was a privately owned company with association in the name. They were actually sold to a global payroll vendor, so one of the largest payroll companies in the world. So at the time you thought I have to get association into the name. Yeah, and you know I did cop some flack for that, but um, mm. you know, and and eventually, you know, I've got there actually um, there are actually eight uh, superannuation associations in Australia. So the fact that there's two with the, with that name in the payroll industry in Australia is actually a you know I, I can live with that. But like you say, I would actually rather that it not be in the name. But yeah, um, yeah based on the you know. That that situation, I, I really didn't have a lot of. Uh, You're in too deep, too late yeah. to change. That's all right. No, Just keep doing good stuff. Now, what you have done is you have followed, and I mentioned uh, the the KPI process and program in last week's episode. Um, you and I have both been through that process. Mm-hmm. It's a five step process, and I guess the the way that I can best describe it is it's about becoming more visible, valuable, and connected in your industry that's kind of it's a it's a i think it's nine months now uh, a program is it nine it, it is a, it is yeah nine yeah. Uh, 40 weeks i believe gestation yeah that's right exactly that's about uh, how it feels as well <laughs> yeah, that's right um uh, you can say that as a woman I, I can't even go there i'm not even agreeing or disagreeing uh, so it is becoming more visible valuable and connected in your industry it's a five-step process and i want you to take us through the five steps that you've been through not any great detail we've only got you know 20 minutes but pitch publish pro profile products and partnerships are five boxes that if ticked correctly really really do set you up to run an amazing business that is well regarded in your industry and you become a key person of influence which is what KPI stands for so trace let's go through that because i think if we if we kind of in, if i interrogate you dare i say about how you've brought to life each one of those p's 
then I think it'll give our listeners a really good sense of of how you've built this business and how they could too. So pitch. Yeah. If I said to you, what do you do, Trace? What would you say to me? I'd say that's the probably the one the the one weakness in my five Ps. <laughs> um, that is not the answer I was looking for. <laughs> I know, I know, and I wish I had a really clever bang on pitch that I could give you. But um, you, pitch is, pitch is really for me. It was all about clarity because I had. I have a sales background, so I thought pitch was going to be easy. Turns out it was actually the hardest part yeah, for me because yeah. um, it, I, I did think that I could be everything to everyone. <laughs> Many businesses do. Yeah, well, and that's and that's just you know I, I was I was working so much harder twelve months ago than I was now because I was trying to be everything to everyone. So mm. the just getting clear on what clarity. Um, brings to an organization like who exactly I worked for who was my perfect customer um the the when I first started the business I maybe maybe subconsciously I thought I would just go after all my competitors uh clients but the reality was is once I started to look at what I actually did and what I offered I didn't I actually don't necessarily want their customers because their customers don't don't want what I deliver I want to find people who actually really get what we do and so I needed to be really clear about what we did and and how we did it. So, really, um, you know, we're we're a payroll business that doesn't do payroll, but we make sure that your payroll is you know uh, compliant and risk free, and your processes are uh, are efficient. And can I challenge you on that? Just say, don't you make payroll sexy? Well, I don't. That's not what I say. <laughs> we make payroll uh, visible. We make payroll an asset to a business where it has been a, a cost to a business. Um, so I don't know that you'd go to your CFO and say, I'm the payroll manager and payroll's now sexy, but you'd say, I'm the payroll manager and now I've got this way of, of really adding tangible value that's going to affect the bottom line. And like my, my hearing client, um, they can now spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on new hearing aids every year and testing um, you know, elderly people for hearing loss than paying, you know, money for their op- payroll operation. Mm. I'd much prefer that they did that. For me, that's what it's all about. It's about making a, a, a sensible, you know, cost-effective, efficient payroll function that adds great value to a business and allows the business to do what they do even better than they do it. Did, did you go through, um, have, you, have you got uh, that pitch? Uh, there was a number of ways KPI teach you to pitch, but one of them was the you-know-how uh, approach, which is so for you, it would be like um, you know, you know how payroll seen as an expense in a business. It doesn't get any coverage in a business, and and in fact, you know, is deemed as something that's you know a necessary evil. Well, and then you get the head nodding of the person who's asked you. Then you offer you know what you do and how you turn that around. How you make it an you make payroll an asset. Yeah, I- exactly. And that's you know that that's what we we uh, do. But the, the pictures pictures great for me to actually get clarity, but it's not like it would be necessarily a conversation I would have with someone. I mean, if if I sort of met someone at a pub, I could have that conversation, but my clients already understand Mm. that by the time they come and talk to us, they already know that they've got a problem. Yeah. The next step of um, the KPI process is publish, and you published a book which I haven't read, and I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to read. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> called the payroll revolution. You published it in March 2013, and and from what I understand, uh, it's had a massive impact on your business. Yeah, it has. It has, and I'm not offended that you're not going to read it, but it's a very good read. If you I, were. I've no doubt, I'm a very good read as well. <laughs> Reid. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I think this is the probably the thing in terms of the KPI process that had had a, the most effect um, initially and what it did is I was already quite credible in my industry. I'd been there for, you know, almost 20 years and people knew me and I had a network but um, the book is such an amazing because the pitch, my pitch is actually this 30,000 word book <laughs> um, and that's kind of hard to do, um, you know, in five minutes. So it's a really amazing way to get your pitch out there. And remember that people who work in payroll, they detail people, they actually like to do things like read books. So it's a, it was a perfect medium for them. And um, But really importantly, it gave me this massive credibility. I mean, I know that, you know, your friend Andrew Griffiths loves, you know, he talks about how, you know, when you write a book, your IQ goes up by 50 points. I felt that. Like it was, people really do treat you differently. I had a situation where- That would make Andrew's IQ 51. <laughs> I was going to say 351. That's, that's right. harsh. That's um, harsh. Hello, Griffo. But 
but it's it's true though. People do treat you differently. And what what it meant for me is that business was just really a lot easier. It was just easier. I I, I was why why because for some reason writing a book makes you someone who people want to do business with. So how okay interesting. So uh, and we've talked about books before on this show. It's a glorified business card. So you you've got prospects coming to you. Uh, for maybe an initial meeting, uh, you hand the book over instead yep. of the business card. You, um, you, I imagine, have prospects coming to you who have read the book. So it's a warm intro. They read yeah. your book, now I want to work with you. Is that kind of the thing that's happening? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I think um, I'm, yet to, I'm yet to not win a, a business where I've given someone my book. Wow. Wow. Uh, what kind of numbers are we talking? Is like the last, is that three people or is that 30 or? No, well, I've had, um, I mean, some books I just give away. Like if we had a conference with 400 people, we gave 400 books away, but, you know, maybe 100. Like, wow. It, it's, it's significant. And, and also partnerships. You know, I, I decided that. Oh, I wanted- stop there. Don't oh, digress. Oh <laughs> Don't try and hijack this flow, Trace. I've got it down to a fine art. I want to explore <laughs> publishing right. a bit more. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> because. Um, Okay, I, I think we know listeners, long time listeners of this show will know that they should write a book. Uh, uh, and I've, my book's underway. <laughs> my, my excuse has been I publish an episode of my show every week. So that's my publishing, but oh, exactly. I will have a book out this year. But um, the other part of that is um, I'm interested to know about the process because it's all very well to say write a book. And 30,000 words is the is the number that the KPI program uh, imposes. It doesn't mean you've got to write 30,000 words, but. I'm, is there a tip for those listening who go, oh, gee, I'd love a book. I'd love to be an author. What's, what's your tip for getting that done? Mm. See, I've tried to write a book before and I got to about 1,500 words and it all got too hard because I think you, you think that you need to start at page one and write to the end of the book and you, you actually don't. So it's just a combination of, you know, mind mapping and pure discipline. Just suck it up and get it done. And honestly, that's how I did it. And I got to the end of it. I got to the end of my first manuscript and I went, Holy Moses! I've just written a book. Like it was actually quite surprising. Did you have a tear? Maybe not a tear. I had. A, I did have a celebration though. <laughs> <laughs> Popped a cork. That's right. But yeah. but but the the thing is, and I know that and I, I love the way Andrew Griffiths uh, says this as well, is that it can't be a crap book. It's got to be a great book because the crazy thing about writing a book is that once you've written it and you get it published and it arrives in boxes at your office. You have this kind of freak out moment when you go, "Oh my lord, someone's going to actually read this." Mm, mm. And and that's a, such an interesting point because content creation, of which we talk about often on this show, and a book is one of the original forms of creating content. Um, the the world, it's easy to create content these days. It's easy to self publish a book. Technically, you know, yeah, you find an editor, find a designer, find a printer. They're easy things to do. It's easy to do a podcast these days. You get a microphone, a MacBook, and Skype, and away you go. Um, but it's about quality of content, and I think therein lies the pressure. Yeah, absolutely. And then you realise that you've committed something to writing that people can pull back at you in ten years' time and underline the, you know, what you've, you've really. It's very, very personal and it's quite exposing. Um, but it's it's given me the most extraordinary opportunities. Give me the top three, three things. So it's got you a hundred, hundred out of a hundred, very high conversion rate. Yeah, that's pretty pretty good. <laughs> I, w- I wish I knew that earlier in my career. Um, oh, I wish I knew many things <laughs> earlier in my career. <laughs> Yeah, well, I I got a call from um, it, it got it got me quite a bit of media. It got me on page eleven of the Financial Review. Uh, nice. They asked me to to ask give some uh, opinion about the federal budget last year. I got a call from Smart Company, which you probably know, and they have fifty something thousand people on their database. So I blog now weekly for Smart Company, all off the back of the the fact that I've got a book, and just and it just makes business easier. Yeah, wow, can't argue with those three things. Okay, everyone stop now, hit stop, start writing. Now, Trace, uh, okay, so publish, tick, pitch, tick. We've now profile as the third step of KPI program. How have you gone about building your profile? You sounded, sounded like even in your corporate life, you had a profile within the payroll industry. Is that fair to say? Yeah, look, I did. Um, but I suppose I want to, the, the thing that I liked about profile is making it more immediate. Um, so I got involved with, you know, I, I now sort of have tw- a Twitter account and and I've got I'm got a quite a, um, a a big group on LinkedIn that um, and one of the other things that that we do uh, every week and really this is how the business started was I I started to produce a free weekly newsletter. So 
six or five or six articles go up on the uh, our website every week and then the newsletter links back to those articles okay let me uh explore that one so uh the six who's writing those five or six articles per week for your website well they're a combination of um of me and our team mm-hmm. and replication of other sort of news like you know when payroll fraud happens right so it goes on your blog yeah there's there's a blog and there's um you know, we might have articles on payroll technology. Uh, there's been payroll. The thing is with payroll is when it goes wrong, it, it often goes spectacularly wrong. So, um, you know, there's been quite a few high-profile payroll disasters in the press, so we, we report on those. Yeah, I'm just looking at your blog now. So you, you're putting them there, uh, additional pages that you add to your website as well, or is it always a blog post? Uh, no, no, it's under the News tab. So if you go into the News tab, you'll see um, you've got payroll news and you've got technology and HR. Oh, and right. So there's literally... Well, we've been doing about 208, I think I'm about to about uh, edition 208 and there's about six articles. So whatever six times 208 is, that's how many articles are on the website. Wow. And so then you're sending out an email to your database uh, yep. with, with, with basically saying, um, you know, welcome to this week's newsletter. Uh, here's the five or six topics we're covering with a link to each. Um, people can't read it within the email. They have to go to your website to consume the entire. Yeah, great, smart, smart. You don't want them reading your stuff in their inbox. You want to get them no. to your website, huh? Exactly. And then, and then you can, you know, it's, and I share that stuff on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, and I find, and the other, the other great thing, I, I, I just think it's the best marketing discovery I've ever had. And I, it's probably so old school for you uh, because you're into <laughs> this sort of thing, but. I use I use a product that has it's a content management system and it manages all my my newsletters and I didn't and and I realized how powerful it is to be able to see who clicks on what mm-hmm. and and the funny thing is I don't actually use it but I I, sh- I should and I will um, so for example if I talk about something uh, and a particular article or even I talk about some of our products I can get a list of who clicked on that what what uh, you you do use it or you don't well I don't use it. And what is it? Well, it's I, I, it means that I can get intelligence on who clicked. Yeah, on what's what. the program? Oh, it's called Business Catalyst. Okay, uh, you, you can. Um, I mean, it, uh, like I use Aweber for my news uh, for my emails. I don't do newsletters, but for my emails, I can see who clicked on what and what the open open rate is, etc. What is your open rate? Because when I hear e newsletter. I start to go to sleep, yeah. but I know, yeah. you know, done well, they can work. Absolutely, they can. And we've done, had a great episode of this show with Shane Tilly, who's an email marketing expert and gave us some great tips. But I am, they, they do send me to sleep. What's your open rate like? Between 50 and 53. Yeah, wow. So it's really high. Yeah. But remember, we've got a really targeted audience. Yeah. And the other thing that I do, which is, I think, um, really important, uh, is I send out the email every single Monday at 6 a.m. I do it on a Sunday night, which is right. often dangerous, but I do it, uh, it goes out at 6 a.m. Now, for any reason that there's some sort of glitch in the system, which has happened from time to time, and it doesn't get sent out so till 10 a.m., between 6 and 10 a.m., I could get 50 emails saying, oh, my goodness, I'm off, have I you know, dropped off your list, or is it not out this week? Or Wow. That's all about expectation. You set yeah. with this content and delivering it. You've got to Just set an expectation consistent. and be consistent and, and yeah. have people expect it. It's like, you know, I always say, you know, the news is on at six o'clock every night, you know, every night at six o'clock. It's, it's like not some nights at quarter past six or other nights at, you know, we, we expect it. And if it's not there, we we freak out. Um, I, it's interesting. Email timing trace is often um, every now and then I think about it, you know, when I've got nothing else to do. Um, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that there isn't a better time. You could do your head in trying to figure out what time and what day to send it. I think it depends on what your audience are like. Well, the only thing I would say, which I'm interested that Sunday night, uh, it goes, you do it Sunday night. I would have thought getting into your into your work Monday morning is the time when you wouldn't be sending someone an email because that's when their inbox is arguably the most full, having had the all weekend to fill up. Mm, maybe the thing is these are payroll professionals you see so they probably aren't on lots of lists like you and I might be right and they're wearing very safe shoes they don't they don't get google alerts um you know things that might fill our inbox up and I've been told by the people uh, that get it that they really look it's what they look forward to they come into work on a Monday morning and they look forward to getting it I've I've have done some trials and I've sent it out later in the day I if I send it out later in the day the readership just drops off a cliff because they can control their mornings yeah yeah well key insight into payroll payroll professional want to be in control 
Well, exactly. And um, the, the thing is too that Monday from a payroll point of view as well is often a busy day. And so I've also thought to myself, why don't I send it Thursday? But I seem to get the best result by sending it on a Monday. Can't argue that. Um, now, Trace, I want to move on. We've covered the first three Ps, the fourth P of you getting the Australian Payroll Association to the place it is today. And I think this is, I'm, I'm guessing this is going to be a really important one. It's, it's products. And um, I imagine historically, a business like yours has operated as a fee for service. You know, it's a consulting yeah. business, but, yeah. you, and it's an intangible business. Uh, you have turned that into you've, – you've made it very tangible. You've already mentioned – and so and you've done that via creation of a number of products. You've already talked about the fact that you've got a – you have gone out and, and created a certificate for and a diploma-level qualification. That's amazing. You continue to consult. What other products are part of the arsenal of your business? Well, we've got – um. So we do the, the training piece. We've, we've got sort of a membership product, which is like an annual uh, membership product, um, and for that, we, we we try to use as few people as we can and use tech instead. So um, we've got, you know, a, a member's portal, although they do have access to humans as well. We do uh, payroll events. Um, we have specialist consulting and also specialist payroll recruitment because now that we're sort of, you know, we're the people that, uh, you know, uh, are talking about um, having this sort of this Inf- this uh, real specialty, we get p- uh, cl- clients asking us, "Well, where do we find the best yeah, wow. payroll professionals?" Uh, and that's a great that's a great part of the business. Um, and we've also then expanded on a lot of those things. Like, for example, payroll recruitment is a really good example that your generalist payroll or your generalist recruiter honestly has no idea what someone in payroll does. So, um, even if you don't use our specialist payroll recruitment service, we produce some online diagnostic tests. So we can actually um, give someone a, a payroll knowledge test and be able to rank them on the, all the areas of payroll, whether it's, you know, leave or superannuation or, you know, fair work comp- uh, or, or, you know, taxation. Um, so it allows organisations to not only test their candidates but also test the people in their payroll team and therefore ba- the do develop their personal development plans based on that. So what hmm. training do they actually need? Because there's no, nothing I find more annoying than going to classroom-based training and sitting through a day where 80% of it you knew already. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. A waste, just a waste of time. Hmm. So we've got um, uh, so, some other um, – w- w- one of the, the big things that we do, which doesn't all that s- sound all that interesting, but I, it's been – has had just as much – almost as much impact uh, on our business as mm. the book is, is a, um, an annual benchmarking survey. Now, no one does this, like Deloitte, PwC, none of those guys do this because it is so specialist. But we just I'm, – I'm just putting our second one together at the moment. We've had almost 1,800 responses wow. covering something like 39 million pays per annum. So we've got a huge amount of data. And mm. – that's you know by having that sort of um, IP just has people coming to us and and then wanting mm. wanting the other things that we do um, because it's a huge insight into the, you know the payroll industry. That's um, that's significant. Um, I should I, how many staff have you got? We have um, one, two. Well, there's me and um, three and a half others. <laughs> so I ask that in in relation to the survey. So back to the survey, is that mm. do you outsource that? I don't. Um, luckily, I don't mind statistics. <laughs> um, I'd love to outsource it, but the the issue is, oh, we use a product called Fluid Survey, which is uh, which is just fantastic. I like it much better than uh, a lot of the other survey tools around. Um, the reason I can't outsource it yet is that I'm really the one that really understands what the clients want to read in the report. So once we've done a few, I think we could, we could outsource it. So once you've got those, that's, you're only in your second year, but I mean, that, that, I imagine that would be a major form of marketing of your oh, business. So absolutely. you get that survey, what do you, you have events, you send yep. PR releases out to the media, you yep. blog about it. I mean. Yep. Send, send invitations to download it from our, our website so we can again track the leads that come in. We're thinking about having, you know, uh, having lunches, sort of CFO or HR director lunches where they come and talk about what their payroll problems might be. It's great, it might be, and we get to understand their problems and they get to get a free copy of our research. Wow. 
Um, so there's all sorts of ways. You talk about, uh, again, just within this whole realm of product, Trace, you talk about a membership. I, I too, mm-hmm. we've, there's a small business big marketing forum, which I wish I'd started five years ago. It's, it, it's an amazing way to build a tribe, mm. to get a sense of the questions people are asking, to be able to give real-time advice on an ongoing basis. Uh, just it's gold. What, what form does your membership take? Well, we have... Um Similar to you, we have a sort of an online um, members portal, but we also have telephone and email support um, to a help desk, uh, which is a help desk of one fabulous employee, um, and she's just uh, she's just fantastic. And what what we find is that organisations will ask, or people in the payroll departments will ask some questions because some payroll questions can be unbelievably complex. Um, but they'll also ne- they also need you often as a sounding board. Like they'll say, I think this is how it should be calculated. What do you think? And we either confirm or say, well, actually, you know, here's some legislation that, you know, you should take notice of. Because you can't actually do that with the ATO or with Fair Work. Mm. They actually won't give you advice. They, they, they can't and I don't, mm. I, I, they're really not trained to do that either. So um, we find that that's, uh, you know, we're actually getting some really senior people that are actually joining just purely so they have someone to run stuff by. Yeah, that's gold. So that's that's a 12-month membership. Do you mind yeah. if I ask, what, what, what do you charge? Uh, anything, depending on what sort of – we've got a small business membership as well, which is like $30 a month, um, mm-hmm. but our, our, mainly our clients are corporate, so it's between sort of eight, 800 and $1,000 sort of depending on a couple of things. But uh, it's, it. it's, it's honestly nothing. But uh, in terms of, you know, if you're a large company, and some of it – most of our clients are large corporate you know, corporates that you would know that, you know, yep. uh, big corporates. So it's it's nothing to them. But um, what it is is it just allows us to get to know them and they obviously then buy our other products that have a lot, um, you know, a lot higher margins in them. Trace, the last P of the key person of influence, five Ps, is partnership, which is mm-hmm. where we're talking about joint ventures and identifying strategic, strategically identifying businesses that help us leverage what we're doing. Um What's the best partnership that you've um, you've got in place? Uh, I think the best one is, um, or well, the most high profile one currently is TAFE, TAFE New South Wales. So nice. TAFE, TAFE are the largest provider of online learning in Australia. I think they have something like one hundred and seventy thousand students on their O ten network uh, per annum. So we were able to, and are very very protective of their brand. So, um, but again, you know, it was one meeting, left the book, came back and here I was going back into a second meeting thinking I would have to negotiate hard and convince them why I'd be a good partner. And the first words out of the education director's mouth was, well, I suppose we should just talk about terms then. So it. It, it, that's what I mean about, you know, the book makes it easy, gets you the, the you know, the partnerships that you want. But we also used, um, I, I had a, a call from, you know, uh, a, a major Australian retailer that I, I can't really talk about just yet, but they've they've called me and said we've got um, you know literally hundreds and tens and potentially hundreds of thousands of small business clients. We un- we have identified that payroll is a real problem for small business. Um, we've got the networks, we've got the brand, we've got all the stuff, but one thing we don't have is the payroll knowledge. So they've come to me, and that that partnership alone would could potentially be, you know, 10 times what my business mm. is now. So, um, and so, so that's one, one thing that, um, you know, that happens. People come to you. Trace, loved what you've shared. I, I think it's fantastic what you've done with an industry that, you know, as you openly admit is, the not, is not the most interesting. Um, and you've turned it into something that is interesting and, and is turning it into an asset beyond an expense for most businesses. And um, I congratulate you on what I would call sticking your head above the trench and and owning that space. Um, what One last word of wisdom from you. What would you say to a small business owner out there uh, who is just really trying to find the bottle, trying to find the courage to stick their head above the trench, stand for something and make a real noise in their industry? Well, the thing that, um, and thank you for your your kind words, it's very kind of you, but um, the thing that really helped me or really got me started and got people sharing my content uh, and getting to know what we were doing and why we were doing it is we just did this newsletter and we shared our knowledge for free and we were generous with our content. So I think if you do that, you know, people realize it, it, don't don't hide your knowledge. Get your knowledge out there because even I think a lot of people find um, that 
they think that if they hold their knowledge back, you need to come and pay for my knowledge. Um, they think that that's the way to, to, to get clients. And really, I've found that if you just give it freely, people will then come back and you'll get much oh, uh, you yeah. know, much bigger deals from it. And I, I certainly, we're, we're charging to our corporate clients, we are charging two, three, four times what we used, what, what, what we did 12 months ago for our consulting services. And it's not fee for service anymore. I do not charge any fee for service. Yeah, Wow. Wow, yeah, I'm right behind you there. I think too many small business owners think that they need to hold on to their their knowledge, their information, their content, and only give it to people who are willing to pay for it. Yep. I think that, and, and there there are arguments for that. They get worried about their IP, their intellectual property. Their you know, no one's going to give them money. Um, but from my experience, and clearly from your experience, um, sharing what you know openly can only build a tribe. Can only position you as someone who knows what they're talking about, and positions you as someone who's confident and I think people are both in that B2B and B2C space are looking for confidence because you know if you're confident then you're more willing to hand money over to someone in the future. Absolutely and it's a lot more fun Tim it's just a lot more fun when people recognize yeah. you as as the expert it's yeah. opportunities come your way it's way more fun and it's 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 much easier to do business so I love it. Tracy Angwin thanks so much for being a part of small business big marketing and uh Good luck with the Australian Payroll Association going forward. And if I do get the chance, I can't promise, but I might read your book. <laughs> oh, that'll be great. You'll love it, Tim. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> See ya. Money, money, money. Must be funny in a rich man's world. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. How many listeners am I going to lose if I can continue to sing the outro songs of my interviews. I don't know. Hey, what about that? Payroll is now sexy team and uh, lots to learn there. I want to give uh, share three learnings that I got from that fireside chat with Trace and then I want to tell you how you can find out more about the KPI program where they run an eight-hour brand accelerator day, which I strongly suggest if you are in Australia, there's some dates coming up and that you attend. Three things that I got from that chat with Trace. Number one, write a book. We've talked about this before. Griffo's been on the show. He's talked about how to self-publish a book. Uh, it is a, a topic I have coming up for a forum webinar in the coming months, uh, yet we can't underestimate the power of having a book. So that's number one. Even if it's an e-book, by the way, don't think, oh, you've got to write the big, you know, the big 300-page book. Just get an e-book written, at least. I've got a whole um, instructional um, program in the classroom section of the Small Business Big Marketing Forum that shows you how to simply and easily create an e-book. Number two, learning from Tracy's, Tracy's chat, be prolific in publishing content. Create content and curate content. Be the hunter, be the gatherer. So create your own unique content and then curate content from elsewhere. Add your own spin, add your own opinion, whack it in a blog. Love it, be prolific. Number three, give your knowledge away for free. Talked about this before, give it away. It'll attract people towards you, okay? They'll think more highly of you. It will position you as a person of influence, a person of opinion, and you will develop a confidence within your best mates, as I call them. So uh, three great learnings there from Trace. Now, um, the KPI program, uh, you, there is a link in the show notes where you can register. They've got a number of days coming up, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Perth. Let me explain what it is first. It's an eight-hour brand accelerator where each speaker delivers a 40-minute talk to arm you with simple and proven methods to significantly grow your business. It is a content-filled day. It is not a day of pitching. It is a content-filled day. You will have the opportunity to find out more about the program in greater detail at the end only if you choose to. Um, Andrew Griffiths will be there. Matthew Mikovitz will be there, two past guests of my show, and AG's a regular. Melbourne, 7th of Feb, Sydney, 13th of Feb, Brisbane, 28th of Feb, and Perth, mid-2014 month date yet to be set. Tickets are 59 bucks or from 59 bucks. Uh, and if you go to the Small Business Big Marketing page, you will see a banner. If you click on that, you'll get a 40% discount just like that because that is the kind of people we are. And I probably will be at the Melbourne event. Not uh, won't be speaking, but probably will be there as a, as a spectator because I just love consuming the information they have to give. Um, 
So head over there. You can uh, click on the banner on smallbusinessbigmarketing.com that says Key Person of Influence and uh, you're away. So I hope you enjoyed that interview. I am now going to get stuck into a listener question. Love a good listener question. This one particularly because it's about podcasting and it's from longtime listener, Mac Smurden. G'day, Mac. Uh, he says, hey, Tim. Love all that you do for small businesses through your podcast. You have convinced me to dive in and create my own show. Oh, I love hearing that. Well done, Mac. As a small business owner of a Melbourne cleaning business, personal housekeeping services, uh, give him a plug, phservices.com.au, I have decided to discuss the topic of home organisation and call the show the Home Organisation Podcast. Love it. I'd actually call it the Home Organisation Show. Um, The the fact that it's a podcast is secondary. I think the show has a better ring to it, Mac. I digress. Mac goes on to say, my question for you is, do you think it's better to have a sister site dedicated to the podcast, hosting show notes, etc., or how's it all on our main site? I hope to add a small online store in the future offering content packages and the other and other nicks and knacks surrounding home organization. Your advice would be truly appreciated to me, and I'm sure there is somebody else out there with a similar question. Warm regards, Max Murden. Great question, Mac, and my answer is pretty simple, mate. Keep all your content under the one roof on the one site. Um, not only is it less to manage, but you are going to build fantastic Google juice as Google demand fresh, unique, useful content. And as you create more podcast episodes with more great content, you might even get them transcribed um, so that Google can index them even more easily. Is that a word? Easily. Then all that wonderful Google juice, all that traffic uh, is going to go to your main site. And if on your main site, as you say, you're going to introduce some e-commerce uh, and sell content packages and other knickknacks, then you want people on your main site where the action is. So think of your pod, your podcast as driving traffic. First and foremost, if you're going to start a podcast, um, it is about generating traffic. If it becomes popular, it may generate revenue in the form of a sponsor, in the form of other things that you choose to promote on it. But it's a great traffic driver, so uh, connect it to your main site. And be sure your main site is set up with strong calls to action, Mac, okay? Something I didn't do in the early days. I started to get traction with this show. People were racing off to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, had nothing to sell, hey? So you want to get those packages right, your service offerings right, whether it be other, whatever those nicks, knickknack things you're talking about are, people are going to go to your site if they like your show, and they're going to want to buy from you. So be sure to have good, strong calls to actions set up. Get clear on your sales funnel. Um, that'll help you with your calls to action. You know, what are you going to sell? The KPI process that I mentioned earlier, one of the things they teach you is how to productize your offering. And they have what's called an ascending transaction model, which I love, which I use in my business, which is offer something free like a podcast or a blog or a series of how-to videos or an ebook, uh, and get as many people you, as you can onto your database. And then off the back of that, you introduce them to something of low cost. They call it a product for prospects. And at that point, you are offering something at a reasonably low cost that appears high value to your audience. So then all of a sudden, you take them into your core product offering, which may be your cleaning service, club membership, whatever it may be. But get clear on your sales funnel. That will really help as well. But to your original question, Mac, which is a ripper, put your podcast on your main site, get stuck into it. I cannot uh, tell you just how good podcasting is as a, a marketing channel. Uh, massively underrated and uh, still in its early days. So if you are thinking of getting one, anyone, get onto it. Get onto it now because it's a lot of fun producing one too. Uh, all right. If you want to uh, send me a question, you can join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Click on Forum. You'll be in there real quick. I'm in there every day, and it's just a wonderful group of small business owners who are motivated and want to make a massive difference to their business and other businesses around them. Or you can send me a question to timbo at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, and I might, I might answer it. Just a quick update on what is happening inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum and a very, very exciting development, which is a value add for current members and future members. I'm really excited about 
Great topics being discussed uh, of recent days include uh, building a virtual marketing team, uh, someone seeking feedback on their logo, someone's asking about setting up a 1300 number, someone else is asking about putting prices on their website. There's a discussion around copywriters and transcribers. There's a number of members sharing their wins, which is fantastic. And uh, there's a Google Plus discussion. Uh, there's why. A, <laughs> there's even a discussion about why audio never goes viral. So uh, some great stuff happening there. And the exciting news is that I have added a monthly webinar uh, that will become part of your forum membership. Uh, we've got our first one tomorrow. Uh, that's going to be, what's that, January 23, 2014. Uh, where we're going to be joined by video marketing expert Ryan Spanger, and we are going to learn all about how to knock video out of the park. And uh, that's absolutely all four members can come on for free, ask questions of me, ask questions of Ryan, and we're going to do one of them a month on different topics. And I'm asking four members at the moment what topics they are interested in hearing more about. I'll then go and find the expert to share their marketing love with us. So uh, upcoming topics, Google+, Plus, uh, networking, radio advertising, search engine optimization, Facebook. In fact, I did an interview, an hour and 15, one hour and 15 minute interview only today with a Facebook marketing expert from the United States, and that's going directly into the forum. So, so many exciting things happening inside that forum. I know there's lots of you hovering, wondering, should I join? Well, give it a go. It's $1 for the first seven days, and you can have a look in there, see the kind of marketing value you get, you're getting. It then goes to $49 a month, uh, no lock-in plan, and it, boy, oh boy, if you're not getting $49 a month value out of it, then... I'm doing something wrong. Anyway, that's the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the forum button, and you will be in there faster than uh, you can say, gee, that forum's pretty good. Okay, so before we wrap things up, I just thought I'd share my travel plans uh, with you. And there's also a Melbourne meetup coming up for listeners of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Let's knock that one on the head first. It's February 26, 2014 in Melbourne. If you're interested, head over to uh, meetup, that's M-E-E-T, up, up.com forward slash small business big marketing and you can register to attend find out all the details about it um, and that's where you can RSVP it's a free get together we'll have a feed have a drink uh, and uh, talk marketing and just amongst other motivated small business owners and uh I'm looking forward to that. It's always fun meeting listeners who uh, are out there at the other end of the microphone. I am also uh, doing some interstate and overseas travel in the coming months. I'm in Brizzy, Brisbane, I should say, on February 11. And uh, if you want to have some kind of mastermind, I'd be happy to talk about maybe putting something together. If enough of you email me, Tim at Small Business Big Marketing, and say at bigmarketing.com, I should say, and suggest that the idea of coming together for a bit of a mastermind is a good idea, then I'd be happy to structure um, a day where we do that. So I could do that on uh, February 11 in Brisbane, February 12 in Sydney. I'm going to be in Shanghai for a week over the week of uh, April 14, starting April 14. And Auckland, uh, I'm going to be in on the 27th of June. Um, those There'll be more dates added uh, as additional speaking opportunities come to hand. Um, but um, yeah, I'd love to catch up with listeners and maybe we can organise a meetup, if not a fully fledged one day mastermind where we break through some marketing blockages that you may have and I can take you inside the world of how uh, I think many small businesses should be approaching the marketing of their business. So... Tim at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com is where you will find me. I would love to hear from you. I reckon that is about it. That has been an action-packed show. I want to thank Net Registry for being a wonderful sponsor, for making this happen. And uh, head over to netregistry.com.au for all your online marketing needs. Get your online marketing sorted. That's what they do, and uh, they will uh, do it for you with a smile on their dial because of their association with this show. Um, enough of that. Have a wonderful week. Lots of great guests coming up in coming weeks. In fact, next week I am going to take you inside a private consultation I did with a lady in Zimbabwe recently. So that's going to be kind of interesting and there's plenty more coming up. So until then, may your marketing be the best marketing. See ya. 
You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Ah, you thought the show was over, didn't you? No, 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 no. Remember now, we read three listener reviews that I receive on iTunes as a way of kind of um, sharing the love around. So this one is from Fiao. I don't know how you pronounce that, but it's F-H-I-O-W, who says, you're simply the best five stars. Timbo, I've listened to your podcast for years now. Thank you. Sorry I haven't reviewed it sooner. The information I've learned from your show has helped transform our business over the years. While I can't give you all the credit for what we've achieved, I'm not sure you understand the impact you have made to many small businesses that escape the grind each week to listen to your marketing gold. Wow, thank you so much. I have a one-hour drive to our further store, and your podcast does it does its part to keep me sane and on track to take action. Thanks again for impacting my business in such a positive way. Well, thank you for impacting my business in such a positive way by saying things like that. I really appreciate it. Next one is from Paul Higgins, 555, Marketing Gold, five stars. I worked at Coca-Cola for 18 years. Oh, Paul's a member of the uh, Small Business Big Marketing Forum. I worked at Coca-Cola for 18 years and left July 2011 to start my own business. I know a little about B2C marketing and had gaps in knowledge on B2B, that's business to business. This podcast has filled those gaps and taught me practical skills to apply to my business. I listen every week with Evernote open and implement learnings from Tim and his guests. As an SME owner with tight budgets, I find Tim's show a must-have tool in my kit bag. I look forward to each episode, and if learning is all about fun, this show has it in spades. Well done, Tim, and keep up the great work. Thank you very much, Paul, for everything you do for the small business big marketing movement, by the way. And this is from Hard Kitty, five stars, SBBM success story. A secret I've not told before. So, here we go. Several months ago, I made a foray into the marketing world for the first time with the help of SBBM, and I'm happy to announce that I'm now a marketing specialist at a reputable tech company. That was tech company. And creating amazing results. After listening to every single episode, sometimes multiple times, plus checking out the recommended reading, which is which was mentioned on the podcasts, I've not only saved my company thousands of dollars, but created 10 times my wage in new business. That is a fantastic testimonial, Hard Kitty. Um, Thanks, Timbo and Luke, for the earlier episodes, for so much advice and support. I'm off to check out the masterclass. Keep up the good work. That would be the content marketing masterclass that one can buy inside the product section of smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Kat, thank you very, very much for that wonderful testimonial and for everyone else who does leave a listener review on iTunes. It helps build my ratings and my ego. See you next week.